What's up, everybody? It's Dan from Binder Boneyard coming at you from the shop. Uh, beautiful Saturday morning here, uh, coming up on Easter. Um, the weather is finally starting to turn here in Central Oregon, so it's uh, pretty nice. Um, anyway, I appreciate all of the new likes, subscribes, follows, shares, comments, all that stuff. Um, I, I do appreciate the feedback. Uh, even you guys that think you're funny, uh, uh, you know, it's all, it's all red, uh, take it all in and do with it what I decided I need to do with it. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, the, uh, you know, I've gotten a lot of, uh, people want to support, support this podcast, you know, so, uh, I normally tell people you can, um, either subscribe on Instagram. There's a monthly subscription you can do there where you get uh, some extra bonuses. Um, and we have the Patreon page. Uh, so you can head over to Patreon, uh, Binder Boneyard over there. You can donate, you know, it's a couple bucks a month uh, or whatever you want to donate on Patreon. Um, so yeah, so if you like these podcasts and you want to support, um, you know, you can, you can financially support but really what I just like is people to share um, and talk about it spread the word get the more eyeballs on these things then you know the more money they can make down the road um, and not just that but also it's putting the information out there that people need um, there's a lot of misinformation about these old trucks there's a lot of bad information from guys who don't know any better, um, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, I'm not calling, I mean, I'm not saying what I am putting out there is like the gospel, uh, speaking of Easter, but I just have been around a while now and have worked on these things for a long time and I've seen a lot of stuff and I've messed up a lot of stuff and I kind of know the ins and outs of them, uh, more so than your casual, uh, international owner. And something I've said for, uh, a long time is ownership does not equate to knowledge. Like I've, I've talked to guys that claim that, Oh, I've owned a uh, scouts for, you know, since they were new in 76. And then they turn around and tell me, you know, yeah, they were made by Dodge because, you know, Dodge needed something to take the place of the Ram Charger. And it's like, no, that's not right <laughs> at all. <laughs> and just because you've owned one for so long doesn't mean that, you know, you're just an automatic expert at it. Uh, so I put these things out to try and help, um, spread the word and you know um just put some good information out there that you know that i've i have gone through so anyway um appreciate everybody that's following along and is looking to learn um so today's episode podcast whatever uh we are talking about c series that is 61 to 68 and I get guys that argue with me because you know their 65 is a you know 1100 D and you know their 67 is a a 1100 or whatever and it's like okay I get it I understand the yearly model numbers and whatnot but the overarching um, description that people use for the round body era is the C series because in 61, I believe, I mean, I could be wrong. I'm, I, you know, I'm not a mathematician and I don't pay attention to the numbers that well, but I believe the first ones were C100, C110, C120. And then same with 62, I believe they were also C models. So, uh, you know, and then 63, they, 
that's when they started like the A1100 and or 1100A and 1100B, whatever. Um, but for the sake of conversation, for the sake of looking up parts, for talking to people about what you need, you know, 61 to 68 is the C series. That's just what they've been known to be called. So um, we'll start at the beginning uh, and the 61, um, you know, there was a change in from the 60s where they went from the four headlights and, and you know, the, the different floor and stuff like that to 61, they, the, the four headlights went horizontal, the grill changed, they got wider. The cabs look similar to the earlier A's and B's but the floor got shorter so uh, instead of the floor being flat like an a and b there's actually a tunnel now um so yeah there were just some changes like that between the earlier models so um the 61s and 2s are unique because they have the early style dash with the like gauge pod that sits up on top of this big wraparound flat dash uh, glove box is in the middle, uh, I believe. No, 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 I'm sorry. Glove box is far right. Uh, radio is in the middle. So they had started to settle it on that because the A's and B's, I believe the glove box was in the middle. Um, but anyway, they started to make these changes. Um, uh, you know, updated some of the stuff. They have different window cranks and different door handles. Uh, the style was just a little bit different. Um, and so there's just some cues that make them a little different. Like I said, the, the dash is its own. The heater box is a weird shape. Um, you know, but, but overall they have that C-series style. Um, you know, base model was a six cylinder, three on the tree, you know, half ton, two wheel drive. And then they went up from there. Uh, you had the 266. Uh, I don't believe, and I'll probably get corrected on this, I don't believe a 304 was available yet in the early, early C's. I think it was just 266s. And I say that because I have a couple of 61s and they both have 266s in them. That doesn't mean that's what it was, but I'm just, you know, my guesstimate is the 304 hadn't quite come along yet in the light trucks. Um, so, and then of course you had the four speed T98 option, uh, the four wheel drive update, uh, still closed knuckle, still drum brake. Um, but in the 61, I believe that is the first year of the half ton four wheel drive. I I want to say, and again, I'm i you know I don't prepare for these. I just go off of my memory, and I don't believe a half ton four wheel drive was available before '61. Um, so you know, there's there was that update. Uh, they used the NP two o two transfer case. Uh, gigantic cast shift lever. Um, you know, the 202 is a predecessor to the, the 205. There's a lot of similarities. Um, like you can put 202 gears, well, parts of 202s into 205s. Um, the bearing retainers, stuff like that are, are similar to the 205s, but the, uh, the 202 is what they had, which is also the the new version of the uh, 201 that the earlier trucks had. But anyway, um, so yeah, so the 61s had a lot of change uh, for the model. Um, but I think 63 is my, um, that's where they really kind of, I don't want to say standardized, but that's where they settled in. Uh, and you can tell that they were taking cues from other models. Um, the 
63 is when the dash changed to the round gauges, uh, similar to what was in an 800, which there you go, foreshadowing, you know, of what was coming out because when the 800 came out in 66, would they have round gauges? So, uh, same with the door handles and window cranks. Uh, the 63 had different style uh, door handle and window cranks from the 61 and 2. The dash also, uh, instead of having indicator lights for your right and left turn, it just had these little slits in the dash, which I thought was kind of weird. Not much uh, visibility when it comes to your indicators, right and left. Um, the grill front end, you went to a single headlight with the kind of, I don't know, we call them egg crate grills. Um, you know, big squares in between the chrome aluminum bars. Um, again, more refinements. You saw a different heater box. The increased capacity heater was available, uh, which has two blower motors and a big U-shaped heater core. Um, the other thing, I guess I, I jumped over real fast, but uh, in 61, the Travelette and Travel All, they went from three-door to four-door. Uh, so um, that was another big, big improvement. Uh, also in 61, the, the tailgate on the Travel Alls went to a power window or barn doors, side-by-side, -side, you know, ambulance doors. Um, that was another change from the earlier... A's and B's. They did away with the clamshell tailgate and and went to the power window. So so those carried into '63. You know, with the roll down window or the barn doors or the you know true four door. Uh, the rear seat um, became a fold flat seat, so you could fit even more cargo in the back of your travel all, which is already massive. You could haul so much stuff in a travel all. Um, you started to see more chrome appointments. Uh, the base model, again, was still a six-cylinder with a three-speed. Uh, you know, I've had a couple, like, like I had a one-ton in here with a six-cylinder and a three-speed. So it just, you know, you could order the things with whatever you wanted. Uh, brakes were getting bigger. Uh, the 60s, you know, that was like the horsepower race. So, you know, I know International wasn't, synonymous with horsepower but every model you know they were they were a little bit more powerful they had a bigger engine option more gears so they needed better brakes um you know you saw the drums were going from 11s to 12s uh, the rears were going you know 12 by 2 uh and three quarter tons anyways um and i believe 63 was the introduction in the light trucks of the five speed so that's when the t34 t35 t36 models became available uh in the five in the in the light trucks uh which is t34 is overdrive t35 and six are direct drives with different gear ratios for the splits um so you know then i think 63 is also when this when the 304 came on because i know my travel at uh that's all original i bought from the original owner they swear up and down the engine never was changed it has a 304 uh it's also a 64 but um anyway so you now you've got the the dash layout is different you got a heater the upholstery styles are different um you started seeing that you know long bed and short beds uh, became more um, in the travelettes anyways you had the long bed or the short bed but international was still offering multiple bed lengths uh, six foot seven foot eight foot nine foot beds were all available in the 60s um, and I know because I have all of them here um, so you know they were they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff to appeal to tradesmen and people you know sportsmen that's what i love about the travel all so much is the sportsman side of it you know all the advertisements with 
hunting and fishing and camping and towing a trailer and getting out and adventure like it really you know international saw the westward expansion and the and the leisure expansion and just like grabbed a hold of it um you know because it was just that was big money you know getting having a rig that could get out and you know your wife could drive to the market on you know, during the week and then you guys could load up and put a canoe on the roof and to haul the kids to the lake on the weekends. Like that was prime marketing for international. And so you see it in, in the models. And, and also, like I said, the sixties was, you know, kind of the golden age of automobile styling and upgrades. Um, so you see it with them. So, so by 65, um, the dash changed a little bit. Again, they added the mark, the actual round indicator lights that you would see in the Scout 800 in 66. Um, you saw different upholstery options. You saw even more chrome. Um, the steering wheel, you know, the deluxe models had the big chrome uh, steering wheel horn button. Um, again, brakes were getting better, bigger. Um, drivetrain, you know, more springs, stuff like that. It just, uh, they were continuing to get heavier duty. You can see it. I mean, I can see it in the yard here. When I look at the front end of a 61 and the size of the tie rod ends and the steering arms and that sort of thing to the front end of a 68 and it, you know, the steering arms are twice as big and the joints have all changed. And, you know, um, the power steering setup on the early ones was the dual Ram, they had a, on the driver's side, they had a sense ram that actually didn't power anything. It just told, it sent fluid to a hydraulic ram that was on the passenger side, which way to go, you know, right or left. Um, so as you turn the steering wheel, you would apply pressure and the little spool valve inside the sense ram would send the fluid out to where it needed to go. Super complicated, real finicky. They like to leak. Um, so, you know. International used that for, well, from 61 to 67 and then got away from that in 68. But anyway, they stayed generally 65 and 66 were pretty similar, slight grill changes, um, minor updates, you know, not, not a lot happening. And then 67, you saw the addition of the brake warning light which is a was a little orange light on the top of the gauge cluster to let you know when you know you had brake problems or whatever because the brake systems became dual circuit a front and a rear um, because the earlier ones were all a single pot the clutch and the brake ran off the same reservoir which is crazy to me but that's what they did so um yeah so they had this they went to the dual reservoir um, master cylinder, the separate clutch slave cylinder. Um, you started seeing more of the automatics. By 66, there were a lot more of the Borg Warners coming out. Um, again, because of uh, every other manufacturer, stuff was just getting, I mean, it was just changing. People wanted automatics and more luxury. And so you started seeing more AC setups. And I have to laugh because the AC systems in the C series is were all dealer installed and there's actually plans to show the dealer tech or fabricator or whatever how to make the bracketry to mount AC an AC compressor to your your travel all or truck or whatever and then the the AC system itself was just this big add-on box that went to the bottom of the dash so it was really interesting to see how they how they did that because um, they were you know international yeah they were they were ahead of their time in so many ways but also they seemed to be caught on their heels in other ways you know like with this air conditioning stuff like they didn't have a they didn't have a change to make it integrated that they could do at the factory. Um, you know, that kind of thing where they should have seen that coming. Like, I really believe if they looked at other manufacturers and saw what everybody wanted, um, 
they they should have come up with that sooner. But anyway, that's just me. Um, so yeah, you started seeing more AC systems um, and more power brakes too. By '67, you were seeing power brake kits that were um, you know you could order from the factory with power brakes, but they were still a little bit homemade looking. Um, and then '68 being the last year of that body style is when they had, you know, power brakes with dual reservoirs. They had the, you know, five speeds. You could get a 392 by 68, the 392 would become available. So, you know, there are a couple of travelettes I've seen that had 392s and five speeds. They were four wheel drive, Dana 70 front axles, you know, for four wheel drive. Um, you know, full, like one ton, like heavy duty trucks. Uh, it was also the first year of the Saginaw style power steering. So you had an actual power steering gearbox mounted on the frame, like you did, you know, like, you know, the D's and Chevy's and everybody else had. So, um, one thing I will say about that 68 power setup is that it does not work on any previous model. I mean, it works like with enough steel and fabrication, anything works. But what I'm saying is you cannot bolt that 68 gearbox to a 65 frame. They don't work that way. Um, so, you know, you want to do power steering on your earlier C. It's a bunch of fabrication and it's a whole change. And we'll get into that here shortly. But um, 68 had the two-piece column with the Saginaw gearbox. Uh, you know, they just updated it something modern the gauges got a fancy brushed aluminum background uh or gold background depending on your trim package um you know just more and more updates more chrome more uh, upholstery options uh like i said the heavy duty stuff with the 392 and and all of that like it really you could really get a 68 to be just as as crazy as you wanted So that brings me back around to um, modernization of the C series is to make them a little bit more enjoyable. Like, for example, my travel at my 64. When I started driving it, it was stock. So 750, 16 tires, four wheel drum brakes, points, two barrel carb, like all of that stuff. So the first thing we did was electronic ignition, put a Protronics in it, I rebuilt the carburetor, suddenly it started easier and it ran better, got better mileage. Um, the next thing we did was changed out the axles to uh, D series, D series international pickup axles. Uh, that I had converted to disc brakes using GM parts. So now I've got 373 gears, 12 by uh, 12 by two and a half rear drums. I have disc brake front. Like now it rolls down the road good. The the manual brake setup did not like the discs. Uh, just not enough pressure there. So then the power brake kit went on, which we sell on our store. Um, so now you know power brakes, electronic ignition, fresh carb. Uh, we put in one of the uh, aluminum fuel tanks that we make. So now this fuel gauge red right got actually, you know, 19 gallons of gas in it now. You know, just updated it along the along the way and so now the final step is going to be uh, power steering. That's the last thing we'll do to it this summer and then I would consider that truck mechanically perfect. Um we may change the motor out because the 304 is is real tired. It leaks a ton, um, so we might change the motor out. But uh, you know, for for functionality and going down the road, you know what I described is is pretty much your baseline. Like if you own a C series and you want to make it drivable and enjoyable, get it so your wife can drive it, uh, assuming she can drive a stick. Um, that's the that's the update axle change to disc brakes, electronic ignition, 
rebuild the carb, or install a holly sniper. Um, power steering, power brakes, that's the, the, the ticket for a good, reliable driver. And then you break into the standard stuff that I tell everybody to do no matter what. Uh, window felts, door gaskets, uh, door hinges to tighten up the sag, uh, you know, upholstery, a carpet kit. Like those, then that level of stuff makes them, them even more enjoyable. Um, you know, some of the stuff we've done in the past that I've, I've liked was uh, changing out the four speed for a five speed. If you can get your hands on a T34 overdrive, um, they're not a great towing transmission. Uh, there's a big jump between third and fourth, but they're a great driving transmission. So if you want to, you know, drive long distances, you live in Arizona and you want to take your travel all on a drive to another state or something, then that five speed is really, um, worth looking into. Or, I mean, you can do the NV 4500 conversion, uh, that IH Parts America sells. And, you know, um, that's a good way to go about it too. But if you're trying to stay all stock or like period correct, uh, the T34 is good. Or if you do update your axles to something with, you know, 354s or 373s, then you get the T35, which is a direct drive five speed. So you get real nice and tight gear splits, and then you'll still have the highway speed of the 373s or 354s. Um, you know, basic lift kits on them. I have another video. If you explore the, the YouTube channel, uh, there's a video on how to lift the C series is with using two wheel drive uh, location and GM springs. Uh, we do a ton of that. Um, so that's something to, uh, to look into if you want a little bit more tire height, um, you know, and then interior wise, like, like I said, it's just, you know, uh, reupholster the seats, make sure your door gaskets are good. Um, you know, the one thing I'll say about travel alls is the curved quarter glass is, uh, unobtainium and super hard to get. So if you have good quarter glass in your travel all, don't break it. That's all I can say about that. Uh, windshields are still available new, side glass available new. The rear glass for the roll up window is tempered curved glass. It's still, it's way more available than the quarter glass is, but it's still another one of those things you don't want to break. Uh, so um, keep that in, in mind. But, you know, really just modernizing them. I, what I love about the C series is, is that they're old enough to be stylish, the round body, the, all the chrome, all that stuff, but new enough to be 12 volt, to have an alternator, to have, you know, modern type stuff. So, um, that's what I, I like about the C series and that's why they're my favorite era. I, I really love the C models. Uh, don't get me wrong. I mean, the black truck with the DT in it and all that is like, you know, the end all for tow rigs as far as I'm concerned. But my daily driver is the 64 Travelette. Like I, I love that truck and, and I will drive it forever if I can. Um, so yeah, um, really, I mean, the, the, the Achilles heels we'll get into really quick on the C series is rust. They are notorious for rust. The cowls have a terrible drainage system and they start rusting immediately. Uh, so if you lay down on your back on the driver or passenger floor and you look up under the dash more times than not, you're going to see giant rust holes. So, um, you know, keep that in mind when you're looking at purchasing one and, and they tell you, Oh no, there's no rust in it. Lay on your back and you look up at that dash, uh, guarantee you there'll be some holes there. Um, which in then in turn rusted out the floors because once the water starts leaking through the cowl, then it drips on the floor and you lose your floors. So that's the real notorious rust problems for the C series is, uh, the valance, like under the headlights, under the turn signal, that is a closed cavity and that collects moisture and it'll rust out the bottom of the valance also. Um, so, you know, watch for that. And they are different. The 63 and four valance is different than the 60, 
65 to 68 valance and even then the 68 valance is different than the other ones because it had the aluminum bezels around the headlights whereas the other ones just had round trim rings so uh, there are slight variations that you need to watch for if you're trying to buy replacement body parts um, so you know little things like that uh, the other problem that the C series has had, I think, was you know, was like the single pot brake system. Like that's scary. It needs to be addressed, you know, sooner than later. Um, the tailgate latching mechanisms are kind of weak and fragile. Um, on the Travelettes, the cab likes to blow apart. And the floor to the back wall will separate over time. Um, what else is there? You know, that's really, I mean, you can really nitpick them apart if you wanted to, but really those were the big downsides to look for on them. Um, you know, if that's, uh, if you're interested in buying one, those are the things to look for. Uh, they never had fuel tanks behind the seat, so don't let anybody tell you they did. Um, the dual tank setup started in like 63 or 4, so that's when you started seeing the driver's side tank. And they were little tanks. They were like 14 gallons. The main tank, the, the passenger side tank, whether it filled through the cab or the fender, you were like 18 or 19 gallons. The auxiliary tank, which would be the driver's side tank, that one was 14 gallons. And then 67, 68, they upped it to 18 to match the other side. And I think that was because of the 392 introduction. So, um, you know, they were trying to keep up keep up with that um i'm not a fan of the dual tank setup because it's a pain in the butt to fill because you got to like turn your truck around or drag the fuel hose across the hood or something and i'm i'm not a fan of that but um you know the upside of the two tanks is just not having to stop as much uh but anyway um yeah i really i think i hit the high points um you know if you really want to get into the weeds on it there you know there's some other videos i have out there about about identifying them and you can check those out too but overall that's the the c series era overview my recommendations my thoughts and uh you know hopefully that helps hopefully you learn something um you know Leave a note in the comments if there's anything else you wanted me to cover or something I forgot, and I'll try to make up for it later. So anyways, thank you for listening. Thanks for following along. Uh, until next time, I'm Dan from Binder Boneyard.